Welcome to Your Property Podcast. My name is Michelle Cairns and with us today we've got Mark Poole. Hi Mark. Hi Michelle, how are you? Oh great, thank you. We had you on, well, it's probably a few years ago now, um, just thinking on the podcast. And it was a really popular podcast. You were talking about how, um, you know, because you're a mathematician by your background and uh, and how people can kind of work out the numbers on a deal. And I know that's something that a lot of people do struggle with, even if they are um you know okay excel spreadsheets and that kind of thing but actually what you know your method around stacking deals um is you know it has helped a lot of people so let's just start with a bit about yourself so just uh, introduce yourself for people who've not heard the last podcast or don't know you before and then sure. so um i've been a property investor now for about 20 years um i actually decided a long time ago when i was a student that you know, property was was a good investment because I did the sums on our hovel, uh, you know, that I lived in at the time and figured out the landlord was, you know, doing rather well, well out of it. And, but, you know, did the usual thing, graduated, did a PhD, finally got a job. And then I bought my first property uh, in London uh, with a view to keeping that and renting it out, which is what I did. So I, I lived in that for about three years, uh, you know, went to work, earned some money um refurbished it and then I moved on and I kept it and that that you know suddenly I was a landlord um and I've done various things along the way buy to let buy to sell joint ventures private investor finance etc etc direct to vendor um yeah and you kind of get the bug and you know the the, the hardest one is kind of your first one um it's kind of rolled from that but you know it's always been with a view to providing sort of pension options later in life that's where I think you've got the flexibility of property because you can you know, take a lump sum, uh, you can take the income, uh, you know, you can refinance if you want, you know, that debt is effectively tax free, it's not, not going to be my strategy, but it gives you lots of lots of options that, that, you know, that you can add on top of any other kind of pension investing strategy you've got. So yeah, I've been investing now for about 20 years. Yeah, a long time. And I, I like how that you started that with, well, I got into property because I did the sums. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of sums you up yeah there you go uh, excuse the pun there um but you know for a lot of people they just become accidental landlords or they are looking to get out of the day job and that's the main driver or they're interested in you know uh, having like service accommodation and making you know uh or, or interior design for example that's why they got into it but you're definitely you know looking at the spreadsheet and saying okay this makes sense and you've got this unique aspect of looking at the longer term play for some people it's just about getting out of the day job and how quickly can they do that whereas your approach is slightly different you're looking at it for longer term from the beginning and either replacing a pension or you know providing a pension if there isn't one available so uh let's let's dive into that then um because i think it's not something that people generally talk about there's lots of talk about getting out the day job um but actually if people can do both and they have the end in mind from the beginning then that's really useful and also for people who are at a different stage in their life or their career uh or just you know their property journey and they're looking for you know stability and they're looking for um how they can get that pension pot at the end but quicker then let's let's talk about that so why does it make sense for you to go through property for uh for your retirement pot i think it just gives much more options uh you know once once you get your knowledge and experience together so you know for me there's there's two golden rules so first thing you can do is buy well so principally that means buying a discount if you can go to direct to vendor that's where the best deals are and that's how i built a lot of my portfolio so for a start you can build in a discount and equity from from day one and then my second golden rule is to you know add value so you buy something where you can add value normally through refurbishment it could be through you know one bed to two bed flat conversion could be you know a garage conversion to create another bedroom downstairs that sort of thing and that's quite unique to property so unlike you know stocks and shares and so on property isn't homogeneous right if I buy an IBM share it's an IBM share you know 
and the price is what the price is and I, I can't get a discount on an IBM share um and I can't add value to an IBM share right? if I have no control over IBM at all right you know even if I even if I thought I could run IBM as a CEO you know I, I'm not in a position to do that so you know straight away that's that's one of the big advantages of property is that it isn't homogeneous um the second biggest advantage of course is leverage so you know if you try going into a bank and saying you know I want to invest in the stock market I'm going to make some great stock picks um you know I've got 25,000 can you lend me 75,000 so I've got 100,000 to play with you know it's just gonna laugh you out of the bank right um whereas that that standard in property investing um I can go to a bank and and get funding for a big chunk of the investment um which is great because obviously that leverages your returns and secondly um you know which is quite sort of prudent now we're in this kind of high inflation environment is that actually you know inflation's got a bad rap at the moment and and, and rightly so with cost of living crisis but actually inflation is kind of property investors friend because what it's doing is inflating away the debt so what's really happening people talk about capital appreciation but it's not so much capital appreciation it's the devaluing of the pound that's what's happening over the longer term because inflation means that you know your pound in a year's time is worth less than a pound today so you need more of them to buy things and we see that because you know price of olive oil is going up or price of milk's going up I need more pounds to buy a pint of milk than I did this time last year and the same is true of property um so you are kind of fixing your debt at a point in time and then fast forward 10 15 20 years and that debt has effectively been inflate, inflated away and what might have seemed like quite a large mortgage 20 years ago you know and I, I can speak from personal experience on this what seemed like a big mortgage 20 years ago you know seems relatively speaking in today's money peanuts because that money simply isn't worth as much anymore and that that to me is where the real power of property is so I get that people want to give up their day job and so on they want to do that quickly but really the for me that the 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 kind of biggest benefit of property is the capital growth it's about being in it long enough and you know set and forget just like kind of stock market investing where it's kind of recognized that you should just invest in index funds and stuff because most actively managed funds don't beat the market and you should just buy over the long term kind of forget about it and come back in 20 years I kind of feel that's that's a similar approach I've taken with with property but you know with some turbocharging built in because you can buy well and you can have value from day one but then you know boring is best in in in, in my world so you know I'm predominantly a single let investor um you know I rent them unfurnished and my wear and tear is low these days I don't even supply white goods um just a kind of built-in um oven and hob so you know minimal maintenance minimum tenant issues I'm not paying utilities I'm not paying council tax uh generally doesn't need to be licensed you know it's as hands-off an investment as you can get which is a bit like investing in a stock market fund right so um you know boring is best um and that's why I got into property it just then gives me that flexibility so I can take some of that income and you know you could cut down your working week and do a three-day working week you could take some of your income and go and do something you're really much more interested in take a pay cut as I say you can sell a property I've got a lump sum and I could buy a yacht and sell around the world you know you've got that flexibility going forward which is what I really like right. about it and you say boring is best how does that impact uh how risk averse you are in your deals yeah I think that well the thing is with with long-term buy to let is um it's it's very forgiving um so as, as long as your numbers basically stack uh then it doesn't really matter you know if I end up like you know it turned out overpaid by five thousand pounds for example or my refurb overran by five thousand pounds or you know I thought I'd get 700 pounds a month rent and actually only get 650. in the long term that's just trivial right because you fast forward again 10 15 20 years and the rent's not 700 anymore it's 1200 and you know I didn't pay 150,000 for the I paid 150,000 for the property and maybe that was 10,000 too much but now it's worth 250,000 buy to let is very forgiving it kind of smooths out any kind of uh you know errors I made at the start so you know am I risk averse I, I I say all property investors need to have an element of of you know needing to take on some risk I mean you've got to accept that if you're looking for a return over and above what you can get in a bank then you are by definition taking on some risk and there are lots of risks in property right because you know I could take on refurbishment it does cost a lot more than I thought I could fall out with a builder I can have tenants that don't pay which I've had you know I've had tenants sectioned under the mental health act you know and 
uh, all sorts of dramas. So um, you've got to accept some risk and you are running a business. But again, I think as long as you're buying well, you're buying sensibly, you're adding value, creating that equity on day one, it's pretty risk averse. Um, and, you know, single lets are never going to go away, right? Two, three bedroom houses that appeal to couples, young families, those are always going to be in high demand. I don't see the government heavily regulating those as a, as a result, whereas we've seen over the years, especially HMOs is a good example, licensing, council tax banding, uh, you know, amenity standards, minimum room sizes, all that sort of thing. And we see that coming now with, with holiday lets, right? Let's talk about holiday lets are going to need planning permission, um, whereas you don't see people saying, oh, well, you know, Two bed houses let to families, you know, <laughs> let, let's regulate those out of existence. I, I just don't see that happening. So for me, it, it's 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 as risk averse as you can get in property. Um, but you, you've got to accept you are taking on risk because you're looking for a turnover and above when I'm getting a bank savings rate. Yeah. And when you're looking for a certain return, do you have, uh, you know, like a range in mind that you won't go below like how does it how does it have to stack for you in order to be a good deal what's a good deal for you yeah and that's changed over time to be honest so I think when you're at the start of your journey you've got to accept more risk in the sense that you might look for a lower return because you're looking to perhaps maximize your leverage for example you're looking to refinance money back out of the deal to go again so what I would have accepted in the beginning is much different to now so back then I used to look for Nothing dramatic, you know, a kind of gross yield of around 7% is what I would look for as a kind of initial marker point, um, you know, which did mean buying at a discount. I, you know, I've invested predominantly down south and in London, so that did mean, you know, looking for for deals even just to get a kind of 7% yield, knowing that that's going to improve over time. That's the other beauty about long-term sort of set and forget investing is I don't need to be quite so focused on my cash flow today because I know in 10 years' time, generally rents will follow wage inflation. And again, we see that at the moment, right? The last couple of years have been a great time for increasing rents. You know, I've increased my rents considerably across my portfolio in the last couple of years, but over 30,000 per year, I've put them up by. And so that, that again, that, that de-risks you because as long as you're not refinancing uh, every opportunity, which, you know, I don't actually believe in, I think you should just let your equity grow, to be honest, because it, it builds in that safety factor. So, I, you know, one of the key metrics I look at is, is what I call yield on debt across the whole portfolio. So actually, what is my return? F forget the equity. Equity is great. And that, that will come into play, you know, at kind of retirement stage. But you can't spend your equity on a day to day basis. Right. So what I look at is my yield on debt figure. So that is what return am I getting on my outstanding debt level, i.e. my mortgages? And you'll just see that creep up over time because your mortgage will stay fixed and your rents will increase. So you might see all your gross yield going down because your equity is increasing, but actually your yield on your debt is going up. And that 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 buys you a safety factor. It it de-risks the portfolio. You know, and again, that that's come into play today where we've got interest rates, uh, mortgage rates going through the roof. So, you know, if you've remortgaged heavily, you you could be you could be in, in, in considerable trouble. Whereas if you've left your debt where it is, you know, the yield on debt on my portfolio is now I, I basically I could withstand the Bank of England interest rate of about 10 percent before I start to worry. So that builds safety again going forward. So um yeah. That's a bit of a long winded way of saying, you know, I would look for probably about a 7% gross yield if I was starting out. But these days, you know, I don't really need to buy any more property. I need I need less mortgages. So I'm much, much more fussy about what I buy these days. Uh, why do you look the deals in terms of uh, yield rather than an ROI? Most people talk about return on investment um, when they... Oh, well, you're going to get me on my soapbox now. So our, our <laughs> ROI... <laughs> ROI is great. I mean, gross yield really is just just a filter. I mean, obviously, I do more than that. That's just an initial kind of, you know, as you will know yourself, when you're finding good deals is is difficult. You need a very quick and efficient sort of filtering process. And gross yield is, is an easy way to kind of do that. But there's more to it because, you know, what value can I add? And if I add that value, what does that do to the rent? Does that increase the yield, etc.? But ROI is a factor, but you can't spend your ROI. And the more you refinance out of the property and the higher your ROI is, the kind of more meaningless it gets because it's ignoring risk. So, you know, I'm going to get a bit nerdy now because I'm a mathematician, but people talk about, you know, I've got all my money back out. So I've got infinite ROI, right? That is one of my biggest bugbears in property. And you'll see this everywhere, right? In magazines, on podcasts, you know, blog articles, forums, you name it. And, you know, number one, infinity is a concept, right? It's, it's not a number. And I've yet to see anyone with an infinite ROI, you know, show me an infinite 
amount of money in their bank account or you know a bbc news flash that says lloyd bank banking system crashed because a property investor got an infinite roi and you know there's not enough zeros on the screen to, to to manage it so you know what does that actually mean it means you've got all your money back out which might be great but you've increased your risk massively because you will now have lower equity uh you have higher exposure to interest rates your cash flow will be lower so you know you can say people tend to see ROI as a kind of, you know, gold standard to hit, especially this ROI equals infinite. But all that means is you've got all your cash back out. Whereas if I'd left cash in, so if you and I did identical deals and you had a, you know, this ROI, I'm doing air quotes here, ROI uh, it, that's infinite because you've got all your money back out. Um, but we did an identical deal and I, I didn't do that. You know, maybe I just remortgaged enough to, I don't know, get the deposit for, for my next place. And I left a chunk of cash in and my ROI is and let's, let's make up a number 20 percent who's done a better deal and the answer is neither of us because if it's an identical investment and it's an identical property with identical rents and so on we've got the same cash flow you know we've got the same rent coming in we've got the same equity in the property we've added the same value you've just got all your money back out which is great but you know you'll have lower cash flow than me you've got a higher exposure to mortgage rates than me you might have more problems refinancing if mortgage rates are high because you might fail the stress test than me Equally, I've got less cash to go into the next deal. So ROI is great, but it, it's not everything because it, it ignores the risk that's inherent in leveraging to the max, um, which again, we're, we're seeing now, you know, if you've leveraged absolutely to the max and you're coming to refinance, you could find yourself in quite a lot of deep water. And so the idea, I suppose, is that you take that money and then you reinvest it in another deal. So actually you can get more cash flow, more equity from another deal, um, whereas you're keeping in your scenario, you're keeping that locked in. So you don't have the opportunity to make that money work even harder for you on another deal. Well, not quite. What I would say is I've got no problem and I've done this. I've got no problem with refinancing, you know, some money back out, back out of the deal, especially in the early days, because like you say, you're, 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 you're trying to grow and you're going to run out of money sooner, sooner rather than later if, if you do that. So refinancing, buying it at a discount, adding value and then refinancing sensibly to get your working capital back out. I've got no problem with that. What I've got a problem with is then, you know, refinancing every five years down the line. Um, and so the, to the point where you will have an ROI of infinite because you'll eventually get all your money back out and you, you think you're you think you're doing great but actually you've just put yourself in a more risky position and don't forget actually if you and not many people talk about this if you refinance um above what you paid for the property and and the property is in your personal name I know a lot of people buying limited companies these days but if it is in your personal name and you refinance above the uh, purchase price you cannot offset any of that against your against your revenue and equally, the other thing you'd be wary of if you're looking to sell further down the line to get that lump sum or to pay down the mortgages on other properties, which is going to be my strategy, your capital gains, again, if it's in your personal name, but true with corporation tax and limited company, that is due on the current value minus the value at which that property became a rental property. Um, so at the point you bought it. So if you refinanced again above the purchase price, you're going to have a large capital gains tax. And in a worst case scenario, you'll actually owe more in tax than you actually made in profit, if that makes sense. And, you know, you'll find yourself in a position where you can't sell. So this whole, you know, ROI equals infinite thing is 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 great in theory, but, you know, the practicalities are, are very different, I think. So just keep the equity in as a for peace of mind for, you know, a buffer, like, you know, just in case things change. And then and then what? And then what happens when you get to retire? You've got all this equity locked in that you haven't taken out. Yeah, well, then you've got lots of lots of options, right? So if you haven't aggressively remortgaged over the years, then your cash flow is probably very, very good. Um, So, you know, like I said, at, at the start, you might be in a position to go down to a three day work working week you might be in a position to take longer gaps between jobs or what I plan to do is you can you know if you've amassed a big enough portfolio you can sell some of that you know bank the cash you gain and pay down the mortgages on the others because I think the long-term gain certainly for me is to end up with I've never looked to grow the biggest portfolio what I really want is the minimum number of properties that are going to give me a comfortable retirement that are mortgage free so that's my long-term aim and these days with with rent inflation over the years you know you don't as especially investing down south, you don't actually need that many properties to have quite a comfortable uh, retirement if, you know, I don't 
don't know what the average rent is. I, I seem to remember reading outside of London, I think it's passed through a thousand pounds a month for the first time. So, you know, if each property is netting 12,000 without a mortgage, how many of those do you need to have a comfortable retirement? Especially, you know, if you had on a state pension and any other investments or workplace pensions you've been investing into over the years, you don't need that many properties. Um, but for me, I don't want any mortgages because if I'm 70, 80 plus years old, you know, do I want to be refinancing, worried about interest rates, worried about paying a mortgage if the property is empty or whatever? And the answer is no. You know, I want the minimum number of properties. So I have the minimum amount of maintenance, tenant hassle, all the rest of it um, with zero mortgage. Um, that's my that's my end game. Yeah, you might need a few more properties if you're investing up north, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's that's another thing. People tempted by chasing the yield up north, um, but forgetting actually. I think the real power is is in the capital growth, and that that for me is 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 down south. And you know, I've seen that in in uh, that was the second property I ever bought. So admittedly, I've had that for you know what I don't know seventeen odd years, fifteen years, something like that. So it's a long time, but it's a good example. So the rent's gone from about nine hundred at the time. I, I forget exactly, but it's about nine hundred a month to I'm getting fifteen hundred a month today. So you know that's pretty good, right? It's gone up six hundred pounds. That's what 66 percent increase in rent that's, that's pretty good but i bought that for a hundred and forty thousand it wasn't deal of the century it was actually a landlord selling up funny enough um i thought it's probably worth about 160 with a refurb it was on the market for 150 i got it for 140 i mean it's not by no means deal of the century but you don't have to over the long term this is my point uh, i was just through an agent i was nothing didn't do anything clever there um except kept, keep an eye on the market um, yeah, so I bought that for 140 and you know, today that's probably worth 425. So that's literally a kind of tripling of capital growth. Now, if I'd aggressively re refinanced that, I wouldn't have that equity say in it, but I haven't. I refinanced it once when I moved on uh to get deposit for, for, for the next place I was gonna buy, and that's it. Um so the cash flow is very good because that's gone from 900 to 1500 and the equity is very good because I have you know my debt. You know, 140,000 at the time, that sounds peanut, right, for a flat in southwest London. But at the time, that was a lot of money. It's all relative. Uh, you know, and again, that's one I moved into and bought. So relative to my um, salary, that was a lot of money. Um, these days, that that would be peanuts, you know, 140,000. I mean, you know, it's just not going to happen again in my lifetime. So um, again, for me, it's the, it's the capital growth, which I could have taken that money and gone up north and, you know, perhaps made more short term gain through the rent but over the long term you know I, I can't see a you know a place up north tripling in value quite so from already relatively high you know relatively high purchase point um to, to those kind of numbers definitely so it seems like there's a few um let's let's call them games to play if you like where at the beginning for people who are starting out and they want to replace their uh, day job their income from the day job then they might be looking at one route where they are refinancing sort of earlier on in the game and um, uh, and getting those perhaps investing up north because they're getting the higher cash flow, but then switching to a different strategy of the longer term play. So I think it's, is it about understanding at what point is enough, you know, how, where, you know, you're, you're in this game and where do you shift that strategy? And that's obviously a personal question yeah. for everybody to answer on their own um some people just love the hustle of it and they just keep going they just keep buying and that's fair enough and that's different yeah. than thinking about it from a okay how much money do I need to live off when I want to retire so you mentioned before about you know now you're in a different stage where you're looking to sell some properties to pay off other ones and that's part of the strategy in this last kind of phase if you like so is there anything else that you think that you do or, or people might not necessarily have thought about if they're thinking of the retirement phase yeah so I, th I think there's, there's there's a few phases that I've kind of gone through so you know I was like everyone else in the beginning I was keen to just get a portfolio I had a very good day job so that helped I didn't need the money to live on um so you know I was buying relatively aggressively uh, and then you kind of move into a sort of consolidation phase which I'm kind of going through now and that's really looking at your existing portfolio and you know you now got a lot of data points so for a start you can look back and you will always get some properties I don't think it matters where you're buying where 
for some reason or other, they're just kind of more hassle than than others, right? They just seem to have higher tenant turnover, more things go wrong. Um, so those are the properties I will look to trim, you know, sooner rather than later. And the second thing I, I'm looking at doing is uh, all the things you look at doing when you're buying a property, you can kind of do further down the line. So I've got some opportunities um, to do. Uh, in fact, that flat I just mentioned in London, the neighbours of uh recently done a sort of one bed to two bed flat conversion by kind of filling in the side return doing a small extension out the back rejigging the the internals and um turning that into a in from a one bed to a two bed flat so you know that's on my that's on my radar that is coming to the point probably in the next five years or so where that will probably need a refurbishment anyway so that you know that that might be the time to do it um and that's a good use of your capital right because it's a property already owned so I'm not paying extra stamp duty I'm not getting extra loan to do it I'll do it out cash etc um so you know that's an example I've got another property that's a quite a large three bed uh, that's got an integral garage again I've had tenants there for for well, probably about 12 years now. So you know, I won't do anything till they move out. But, you know, the garage is crying out to convert into a sort of downstairs ensuite bedroom, turn it into a four bed. You know, I'll probably add another two, three hundred pounds a month to to the rent for relatively low cost. I mean, OK, cost of materials and stuff have, have gone up, but I don't know, maybe a garage conversion is 15,000. But, you know, that's a very good return on on investment for, for that capital input. So there's all those sort of consolidation factors you can do and if that pushes rents up then that actually just means well you know going back to my end goal which is to have as few properties as possible that gives me a certain level of income well now I kind of need fewer properties because I've just added added rental value to the ones I've got so you know perhaps I can sell a few more and or maybe do that earlier so then I'll move into the kind of sell down phase you know that's definitely not now um, certainly with the market as it is um but you know i will look at, 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 at starting to trim my portfolio and paying down the mortgages and you know i look at a range of factors not not just a question of well which one's cash flow most it's you know which ones am i happy holding which ones give me the the, the least hassle um i will apart from maybe the london ones i would probably sell all my flats because you know as you go through this this property game you realize that service charges only ever go one way and that's up uh your leases are reducing um and yeah you know, there's always hassles with managing managing agents and section 20 notices and all, all that malarkey so I'll probably trim some of the flats as well so that's my kind of end game oh okay and what about the interest rates then so are you someone who fixed them all at 10 years when they were really low yeah that yeah. I mean that that was a great move <laughs> <laughs> I'm so good that I didn't do that <laughs> well I'm the same I didn't do it either so you know again this is where I'm grateful that I haven't aggressively refinanced over okay. the years that makes me feel better <laughs> I, I'm getting bitten because again I was buying before buying in a limited company was, was, was a yeah. thing and right. I know you can incorporate in a limited company but then I think you've got to you know prove that you spend 20 hours a week on your property business you know and I've deliberately set things up where I don't spend 20 you know I can't do anything worse than spending 20 hours a week on it to be perfectly honest so um I just kind of left it be um you know so that, that's just just part of the cost of doing business I suppose regulation comes along you have to deal with it um yeah I mean it's a bit of a perfect storm interest rates are going up I've just had to refinance three off of five-year fixed rates onto I've gone on to new two-year fixed rates and I hope that interest rates will be lower in two years yeah those mortgages have literally doubled um but they're all still cash flowing because I haven't aggressively refinanced um you know and I'm pleased I haven't you know sometimes you think well I could you know there's all that kind of equity sat there and you know because it's a loan it's debt it's tax-free um but you know now, now I'm glad I haven't so again that's why I think your long-term strategy should be to to remove the risk of interest rates because when we're right only have to go back what two years COVID hit interest rates went down to 0.1 percent you know who could have predicted two years later we, we we'd be where we at right it's, it's great with hindsight well you could argue COVID with the you know the, the increase in pumping capital and support into the system was always going to result in inflation in the end and the typical way of combating inflation is raising interest rates but you know all that's easy with hindsight so again my my long-term plan is to get rid of any interest rate risk whatsoever yeah it's interesting and I hope people are like really picking up on what we're talking about here because we I um the last podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago was with Simon Zucci and he was saying the same thing about 
um, you know, making sure that you stack the deals well. And, you know, I obviously trained with Simon Zucci years ago, and he always said to stack the deals at 6%, which is what I did do. So now I'm the same as you. I've got a handful coming out of those fixed mm. uh, rates into the trackers, and they've doubled, but uh, but they still cash flow really well. Yeah. And there's still the equity in. So it's it, it's a balance, isn't it, between, you know, how risk averse can you be? How much do you need the um, the cash? Now, I think that like, for me personally, once I had bought back my time from the day job, suddenly the pressure was off. So there was a big race yeah. at the beginning to get out of the day job and, uh, and have the highest cash flowing properties that I could find. Ten bed HMOs, seven bed HMOs and, you know, and all this kind of thing. But um but actually what as soon as i uh was able to leave the day job and i had all this time back it's like okay right now let's go through a bit more consolidation let's you know look at different types of deals you don't have to do the deals and it's interesting what you said before because i feel like i am a little bit of the opposite of you so i did all of the high cash flowing stuff at the beginning and now i'm kind of like well okay it's it doesn't have to make as much money as it did back then because I want an easier life. So I don't want the hassle of having, you know, exactly. lots of tenants and uh, and and all of that kind of business set up, if you like. Now, the single lets are more where I'm going, whereas it sounds like for you it was the opposite. You're looking for a higher return now because, well, you know, you don't need to. So yeah, so you... I, I still do deals. Um, so, but, you know, I can get the higher return much easier by, you know, rejigging my current portfolio, basically, yeah. and doing those one to two bed flat conversions or three to four bed house conversions. Um, you know, I will still do buy to sells, not, not not now in the current market, but you know, I will still do that sort of thing. Um, you know, I've done joint ventures, private investor finance. And the other thing I, I have dipped my toe in the water at is, is mixed use properties, which again, I think a lot of investors don't really think about. So, you know, that's where you've got, you buy a freehold property and you'll have a commercial um you know shop retail area downstairs and you know one or two flats above and that's a kind of mini niche that i don't think too many investors look at in fact when i speak to agents they say that there's kind of a sweet spot where true commercial investors tend to have very deep pockets and they just want the commercial stuff so that they're off buying warehouses that they let to amazon you know where, where you need deep pockets um or you know shopping malls and that sort of thing and they're not interested in the residential piece and they talk to residential investors and they generally shy away from the commercial place because you know it's a whole different ball game it's different leases you know different sort of um rules and regs around it so they kind of shy away from that so this kind of you know so true commercial investors are kind of at least five hundred thousand plus if not million pound plus and residential investors don't want anything to do with commercials. So there's kind of sweet spot in the middle around that, you know, depending on where you're buying around the sort of 250 to 500 mark, which no one's really looking at. Um, okay. I actually did a joint venture with a guy and we bought a um, mixed use property and we were literally the only, I can't, I'm trying to remember the figures off the top of my head. I can't remember what it was on for, but we made a relatively low offer and he said, no way. And we said, fine, we'll leave it with you. And then three weeks later, he come back and said, yeah, okay, fine. So we must have been the only buyers in town. And the agent said, you know, there are very few people looking at this space um but actually it's not too different from a single let it, it's you know this is a, yep. a, a a retail shop downstairs and a two-bedroom flat above so it's just it's like having two flats in one building except the commercial is even more hands-off because you know it's all fri fully repairing insuring leases um upward only rent reviews blah 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 tenants in you know responsible for the maintenance and, and so on so that's even more hands-free so you know that's where I would if, if I was still buying aggressively I'd probably look down that route because the yields are better and you can get some 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 decent deals and the retail you know retail market is is dying a bit on the high street but you know we've got a tattoo artist in there right Amazon you, you, you want tenants that Amazon can't replace so you know tattoo artists coffee shops that sort of thing yeah. uh, that those are all that those are never going anywhere and you kind of want a sweet spot where the rent isn't too expensive so it's actually quite attractive to a wide range of sort of sole traders that might be looking at starting up a hairdressing salon or a tattoo shop or a coffee shop so around the sort of five six hundred pound a month mark is is I think sweet spot for probably quite a lot of traders and then you've always got value add again with commercial you know I know people that especially if it's not resi above you know permitted developments right so you can convert to flats or uh, I've got a friend at the moment you know converting the rear of commercial to um to a flat you've got all those elements of adding value as well so 
you know, that's where I would look rather than going down to the kind of intensification of use, as I like to call it, where, you know, you're turning a three bed into a six bed HMO with all the regs and hassle that, that can come with that. Yeah, definitely. I've got one of those um, uh, commercial to resi as well. It's one of our best performing properties. Yeah. Bought it for 60,000. Wow. Um, I know. <laughs> Six zero, you heard me right. Sixty thousand, and it's a hairdresser's so on yeah. the ground floor. She pays four hundred fifty. One bed flat above, one hundred fifty again, and they just take over. Um, so that's six hundred uh, a month on a sixty thousand investment. I mean, you know, you do that all day long, right? That's all day long, and that one we brought a private investor in, so we didn't, you know, we didn't go down the mortgage route. We had a private investor to be the mortgage host. Nice and easy because at that rate, at that at those uh, purchase prices, you can offer someone first charge yeah. for a relatively you know small amount of money. Uh, you know, actually, that's a good point when you're looking for investor finance. It, it, it again, you're not asking for five hundred thousand, right, to do a deal. It's much easier to raise sixty thousand, especially with a first charge over a freehold property, and it is trying to raise five hundred thousand. Um, yeah, they're quite deal. rare, I think, offering that kind of money for first charges. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, that's was cracking Definitely. deal. So I do that all day long rather than an HMO, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, same, same now. It's a good type of mix, you know. But but I always say I'm I'm happy with the diversification of my portfolio. I've yeah. got some HMOs, got some um, single lets, this one commercial, blocks of flats, and it's it. You know, I like that gives me peace of mind. Yeah, the fact that they're in different locations, different tenant profiles. Some of you know. Um, on the council the lha rates some of them are professionals and, and it's fine it's nice to have that mix yeah um but yeah so tell us anyway about this book that you're writing at the moment and oh yes where, where are you up to with it what's what's going on in the book yeah so the book's come about i was kind of a that was actually a lockdown sort of thought i was going to um yeah lockdown happened we're all sat at home right wondering what to do um luckily my portfolio survived covid all the rents kept getting paid so i think what should i do i know i'll write a book um, a non-fiction book i don't think i'm i'm a storyteller as such um so i thought i'd write a, a book on property and then you know that's, that's kind of sat on the back burner for a few years but I, i'm finally going to push it forward so what i've really tried to do is distill 20 years of experience um down to a book so you know my working title is part-time properties full-time profits uh, a four-part strategy to building wealth through re- through property for, for busy professionals and it's really there's kind of four key hurdles right so there's there's finding the right property deals um again sticking to my two golden rules there's making your working capital go further as, as we've discussed so you know what, what most people call brr right by refurbished refinance um you know one to two bed flat conversions that sort of thing hurdle three is sort of managing the properties and the tenants which again people don't really talk about but actually that's where your money is because you know if you're not looking after the property if you're not getting the right tenants and if you're not taking care of it you're either going to get bad tenants you're going to get dilapidated properties you're going to get tenants that don't pay um so you know, i think that's a crucial element and to be honest for, for most people that's kind of enough if if you've got a good day job and um you can save heavily and so on you're happy with your day job then as long as you can source deals add value refinance manage them well then rinse and repeat basically but then you know the fourth hurdle which we've all faced which is running out of money um so that's about how to find attract and use private investor finance how to join do joint venture deals and you know leverage someone else's capital and experience as well so putting all that together in a kind of you know and it's it's not uh you know i'm not gonna leave key parts out and say you know to get the secret sauce you've got to you know pay this it, it's, it's going to be kind of warts and all i'll put everything into the book so yeah that's what i'm working on and that's all based around my what i've called the retirement accelerator property system i kind of retirement accelerator rather than retire early because you know i think if you're happy in your day job then stick at it it's much easier to do property if you've got a day job because you can save money not reliant on the income it's easier to get financing you're de-risking issues around not getting rent and so on and you know i would say if you really don't enjoy your day job then you know find a day job that 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 you do enjoy and try and build a property portfolio along with it but bear in mind that property gets you to retirement quicker or at least gives you the flexibility in the future that you know you can go down like i said to a three or four day week so yeah it's hard work writing a book but you know i'm gonna stick with it because it's been (laughs) It's been on the to-do list for too long. So yeah, work in progress. Watch this space. Great. Well, we look forward to finding out more. So we'll hold you to account there. (laughs) Thank you. Okay. (laughs) Um, We will let everybody know once you've got your book released and published and, um, and people can find out more. Tell us about where people can 
go to find out about yourself and I know you do your own training and uh, mentorship for, for anyone who's interested in working with you. Yeah, I do. So I do training based on those kind of four four part strategy that, that I just spoke about that I will turn into a book. Um, but I also look after smarterpropertyinvesting.com. That, that's my website. So you can go there. Um, you can send me a message if you want to send me a message. Happy to have a call with anyone, you know, no selling. Happy to chat about property all day, as you can tell. So happy to have a chat about anything property related with anyone. Uh, if you go there, you can also sign up for my uh, free property investment starter guide, um, which will just give you some sort of tips on where you should be focused if, if you just look kind of start of your journey um and if you do sign up and and grab my freebie then you'll go onto my uh newsletter list and i do a five bullet friday email where it's just short and concise five literally five bullets of what's going on in the property world anything amusing i've come across any personal anecdotes and so on any deals i might be working on myself so you know sign up for that amazing i didn't know you did that one so i'll be signing up for that <laughs> okay good <laughs> look forward to it um it's good to you know hear what other people in the industry are, are, are seeing and um good to have your finger on the pulse of what's going on as well so that's great well thank you so much for your time mark it's been absolutely delightful as always no really it. informative thank you very much um, for having me on thank you all right well for everyone else who is not yet a subscriber to the magazine ypm magazine click the link in the show notes for your free 30-day trial and we'll see you next time guys thanks thank bye-bye. you bye-bye.